Okay, now I'm going to go live. It's 12.29 and I need a moment. Live on Facebook and then I'm gonna put it up on my phone to make sure it's happening. Share to a page. Now we're going live. Let's see if it's going live. There you live stream. Hi. And now let's move back over to the and come up. All right. Here we are live. Hello, everyone. So nice to see you. Just kidding, we can't see you. I'm Kristen Casado. I am Director of Communications for the Connecticut Chapter. And joining me now, two of my colleagues. Christy, would you introduce yourself, please? Hello, I'm Christy Koval. I'm the Director of Public Policy for the Alzheimer's Association Connecticut Chapter. And Esther? Hi, I am Esther Pearl. I'm the North Central Regional Program Director also for the Connecticut Chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. And today we thought we'd talk about something really upbeat, <laughs> grief. And the reason why I thought we should talk about this, multiple, multiple reasons. First of all, everyone here on this page has had a pretty major loss in their life. Um, a couple of us to dementia. So we thought it made a lot of sense, but also we understand um, that a lot of people are going through this, that the holidays are not super duper happy for everybody all the time, that is for sure. And so today it's kind of like allowing you to be this way, right? Allowing you to have all these different feelings and just also talk about the different kinds of grief. We want to talk about that as well. And also just to share with you guys that we literally at multiple walks to end Alzheimer's in the fall ran out of purple flowers. What does that mean? For those of you who've never been to walk, the purple flower is the one you hold when you have actually lost someone to dementia. So a lot of people's flower color actually changed over the last two years. Many due to COVID, many just due to life, right? And the end of the dementia journey. So we thought that this would be um, a good topic and wanted to talk about it. So um, if maybe I thought we could start a little bit about, so my brief uh, uh, introduction to this is that I lost my mom to dementia. She was um, 61 when she was diagnosed and she passed away at the age of 65. Um, Esther, maybe you could share a little bit about your story. Sure. So Mark Corcoran and I were married in 2010. And in 2011, he was diagnosed with atypical young set Alzheimer's. He was 56. And he passed away in 2017. So I think of him every day and his memory is really my inspiration for the work that I do every day now. Amazing, and you, you, you do put him and you in everything you do. And Christy, you as well, you unfortunately suffered quite a large loss as well. Yes, um, so my husband, Tracy, um, who I was married to for 20 years, uh, passed away in 2016 from a rare form of testicular cancer. Um, you know, and since that time, I feel like I've been able to contribute by helping our local hospital start a young widow support group. I've written um, articles for publication and done blog posting and um, just recently spoke at our local hospital on holidays and, gr and grief. So I think it's interesting to talk about um, the different kinds of grief. Um, and Esther, there's something called anticipatory grief. So could you explain that a little bit? So anticipatory grief is the process that many of us go through as somebody progresses through dementia. And what we're grieving is the little losses that happen every day and the big changes that happen over time as well. You know, we all know how this story with Alzheimer's ends. It ends the same for everybody. Right now, we work really hard to change that for the future, um, but we know how it ends right now. And so there's this anticipation, knowing that there's a progression and it's an irreversible progression. Um, so shortly after I started working for the association five years ago, I was preparing for a class to teach a class. And there was a video clip in one of the classes that talked about this exact thing, this anticipatory grief. And when I listened to it and I read about it for the first time, 
everything connected for me. And I remember running into my supervisor's office and saying, I get it. I get it. This is what I'm going through. I've mourning. I've been mourning since the day he was diagnosed. He's still alive and he's still here. And, and you know, we still create beautiful memories, but I'm grieving and I'm, you know, he's still right here with me, but yet I'm grieving every step of the way. I think it's interesting too, right? You grieve, you know, I've noticed that with my mom as well. I, I grieve the loss of her ability to communicate. I grieve the loss of her ability to react to me, right? We're best friends. So the reactions weren't there. Um, mm -hmm. then, then you lose, she lost verbal ability. Then she lost the ability to walk, to feed herself, right? So it's, it's, it's these multiple sets of mourning, this multiple set of mourning, I think, which is which is really, really challenging. And Christy, I think it's a good time to talk about this now also because we are headed, well, we're in the middle of the holidays and this can be a, a tough time for people. Absolutely. Um, you know, we're constantly being told everywhere that it's the most wonderful time of the year. And for many of us, it's not. It's the most challenging time of the year. And really touching upon, Esther, what you talked about with the anticipatory grief, um, particularly if you've lost somebody, you know, you're, you're looking at a whole set of milestones ahead and the holiday is, you know, whatever holiday you celebrate, it is a milestone. So you can have a lot of anxiety around the holiday, um, you know, lack of motivation, difficulty concentrating, and really the anticipatory grief of what am I going to do? My loved one was with me last year at this time, or it can be very triggering. And so the anticipation of the particular holiday time can, can be, can create a lot of anxiety for people. So what can we do? What, what, what can we do? Is one thing definitely to allow ourselves these feelings, roll around in them a little bit and then move on? What, what, what can we do? You know, I think what people need to know is that they need to just exactly allow the feelings to happen. Recognize that the holidays without your loved one, they're not going to be the same. Um, and it is to really give yourself that permission to do whatever is going to make yourself feel comfortable, whether that's rest, you know, exercise, um, incorporating your loved one into the holiday, whatever that feels like, um, whether it's making a recipe that somebody may have enjoyed or putting an ornament on the tree or listening to some music, um, if that feels comfortable. Um, but it's also really, you know, communicating with your network of friends and family um, of direct things that you may need. Um, I also like to say that if you're getting invited out to holiday gatherings this time of year and that you've had a loss, it's really important to, you know, if you feel like going, go, but have an exit strategy, right? You don't have to go and, and spend hours and have it be something that's going to really be taxing on yourself. You can have that exit strategy and make an appearance, or you can just choose not to go. Um, so I feel like all of those things, you know, mapping out a plan of how you're going to get through the holidays is so important and recognize that you will get through the holidays. Like they will be in the rear view mirror. Um, the anticipation is often worse than the actual day of. Right. Esther, you had shared a story with us when we were talking about what to include in this um, about a time when grief just came up and hit you right in the middle of summer. You did not <laughs> expect it. Yeah, so uh, a couple months after after Mark passed away, um, I was going into a dollar store and I, I have no idea what I was going in for, but right there when I walked in was this huge display of peeps, all different colors and flavors and shapes. And my immediate reaction was, oh, Mark loves peeps. I'm going to go grab one of everything and make sure he gets them. And then in a second, it struck me that I can't, I could buy them but he's no longer with us. And I had a complete meltdown in the middle of the entrance to Dollar Tree. And what, what surprised me the most was how strong my reaction was from seeing the peeps. It was kind of a joke with us all the time that you know I always had to get peeps from Mark and he would eat the Costco size batches and then blame it on my son and you know not take responsibility. So we had a whole lot of jokes and really, really happy memories around peeps. So it, it just shocked me the extent of my reaction. And that that was that was hard. That was really hard. Brought on by peeps. 
Christy, you have a, you have kind of a similar situation, a story as well. I do. I do. And, you know, and it wasn't holiday focused. I, the first year too, um, just I, to clarify, I traveled um, at the Christmas holiday at the first year after Tracy died, which that's also a strategy that people have. They just basically avoid it, right? Just do something completely different to, to change it up. Um, so I think, you know, recognizing that emotions and feelings, they're going to hit you at any time. You're not going to have any control over them, particularly in the first year after you've lost a loved one. Um, you know, one of the most difficult milestones I had was actually the first day of the Red Sox opening season. And it took me a while to realize why I was so off because Tracy died in August and then this was April and I was just off at work and I couldn't figure out what, what it was, what was happening. And then I realized looking at all the posts of all the pictures of everyone who was at opening day and all those things. And it was a day that we usually took off and we went to it the year before. So um, just recognize that things like that can happen and to allow yourself the emotions, the feelings, and it's, it's a good thing when, when you can release those. Yeah, I think we, we also talked about, you know, in dealing with the holidays, and it really doesn't matter what year it is, you know, if it's first year, second year, if the person mm -hmm. is still with us in a memory facility or in the hospital or whatever, um, you know, if you don't want to have a tree up for four weeks, you don't have to have a tree up for four weeks. If you don't want to do any sort of decorating, you don't have to do any sort of decorating. If you don't want to, um, you know, do any sort of the holiday thing, right? It's, it's more like do it do what serves you, right? Do what makes you feel okay at the time. Right. Yeah. You know, it is. And every year is going to be different, right? If you're caring for somebody, you know, who has dementia and they're changing, you know, we always tell families like do what's going to work for that person, right? Because the disease is progressive. And it's the same thing for yourself. If you've lost somebody each year of the holiday, you may feel like doing something different depending on how long ago the loss was. So each year for me, the holidays are always a little bit different in terms of what I want to do with decorating, you know, what family I see and when and what traditions I want to incorporate. And every year it's, it's a different experience. And I'm, I've gotten very comfortable with that. I think it's important to acknowledge <clears throat> that, like Christy said, you can't go back. You know, if we all had one wish, it would probably be to have our loved one with us again. Um, so we can't go back, but what we can do is go forward and create something beautiful, something new. Um, every new, every tradition starts as a new thing. It starts somewhere. And so it's okay to let this be the beginning of something new. Um, whether your loved one is with us or they've passed, you can create that new memory, that new tradition. And it doesn't have to be anything dramatic. Um, it might just be one small thing that you do. And the tradition might be something that involves your loved one if they're still here with us. It could be something you do together while they're living. It could be revisiting something you did while they were alive. Or it could be something you do for yourself, by yourself, or with other people. Um, you know, Christy just talked about taking a trip and going away. And if that's what you need, that's okay. You can have your own new tradition. Yeah, I just, I just had a memory just now, you guys. Mom was in a facility um, and, you know, family decision, family choice. And my brother and I um, got a little bit of, we used to do the Italian antipast, right? Kind of a, a version of the seven fishes. And so we, we had little bits of snack and we brought them to her and we just thought we'd have a nice picnic, you know, and, and she just was not at the time, just not aware and just not understanding what we were doing. And she was kind of upset. And who are we doing that for? You know, were we doing it for us? Were we doing it for her? We're like, oh, we'd like her to have a nice, but we also were trying to hold on to this older thing, right? And, and it didn't it didn't fly, you know, uh, despite the fact that everything was individually wrapped and it was such a whole preparation, it, did, it didn't work. And so you just have to be, okay, you know, we tried and, and that just didn't work. Um, but there are a lot of things you can do. And Esther, I would like to talk a little bit about people who are still with us who have changed. Um, some holiday tips with dementia. Um, I think one of the most important things we always share is to make sure that the person, if they're with you at the home, you know, have them be involved in some way to give them a sense of worth. Right. So whatever your loved one has always enjoyed doing, um, and we talk about this in a lot of our community education programs, is trying to 
acknowledge what the person can do, not focus on what they can't do, but keep the parts of what they can. So for example, mom might have been the one that always made the Christmas cookies. So it might not really be safe for her to be on her own and making cookies and leaving the oven on all night and burning down the house and whatnot. But there's still parts of it they kept that she can do. Maybe she can go grocery shopping with you and help get all the ingredients. She can tell you which are her favorite recipes, which cookies does she want. She can help mix all the ingredients. She can help scoop it onto the pan, maybe have somebody else take it in and out of the oven if that's not safe for her. And she can tell you which one she thinks came out the best and she can help serve them. So there's still many, many ways to keep your loved one involved and just you know, remember that focusing on what they still can do and not focusing on what's become more challenging or difficult or perhaps not safe. Um, we also talk about effective communication strategies. Um, so it might be things such as keeping a group small, too many people, too much noise, too many little kids running around, too much partying, too much you know, uh, sports on TV, too much noise, it can be very, very overwhelming for somebody with Alzheimer's or another dementia. And um, that can feel very isolating to a loved one, even though they're surrounded, they also are overwhelmed. So perhaps having a quiet space available just for somebody to rest, to relax a little bit, to have it more quiet. And even looking at the traditions that you have, Kristen, you had a great example. And I love when you said, you know, was taking the platter to mom for you and your brother, or was that for her? And you learned perhaps mom wasn't appreciating for what it was, and that's hard for you. But thinking about what's in the best interest of your loved one who's living with dementia. Um, Connecting with the person so you may um, make sure you get someone's attention before you start speaking to them. Um, not having 20 people barking directions at the same time. I clearly remember family gatherings where that would happen. You know, 10 people were all trying to help Mark stand up at the same time or tell him where to sit for dinner. And that never, <laughs> never worked well. One of the classes we offered, and I know Kristen, you're going to talk a little bit later, um, is this effective communication. So we have them virtually. There are a few in person still available um, through our website, the Community Resource Finder. Um, but the more educated you can be, the better. And I think the better you can prepare people who will be there that perhaps haven't seen your loved one in a while. They they may not know the progression, they may not understand what's happening, but if you can give them some education, some information beforehand, and some tips, I think that can go a long way to just making the day go a little bit smoother. Yeah, and you allow yourself to be sad, you know, if it's not the same, and she or he is not the same, and when you ask them to set the table, they put four cups and two napkins on top of something else. I mean, just, this is the way it is. You just have to kind of let it go. You know, they're involved and, and that's great. And no, it's not going to be the same, but yet, like you said, Esther, you can make some, some good memories and, and, and just try to enjoy your moments and enjoy the, the beautiful moments. Um, talk to you a and Kristen, I, yes. Kristen, I just want to throw something on, um, some advice I had been given, um, which was try to find those moments where you can laugh so for example, if some, like you just said, if somebody's setting the table and they put out four cups, you can make a joke about it as long as the person is responding appropriately. So, okay, Uncle Joe, you really want me to get drunk this year if I'm drinking four glasses of wine or, you know, are we having a taste test for different beers this year? Or, you know, just something to kind of lighten the moment because those are the moments that you'll remember. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Christine, we're talking about dealing with someone who's, who's grieving, um, and we talked a little bit about this, how about some of the things that, that people could say to a person who's grieving, right? What are the right things and wrong things to, to say? Because we're all gonna make mistakes. You know, I'm sorry for your loss. I don't know how you're feeling. There's all sorts of things that can come up like, oh, well, boy, I bet you're gonna be happy when this is over. You know, Christmas is probably awful. Well, there are certain things you could say. Certain things you I know. Should. Um, you know, 
it's interesting and and we were as we were chatting earlier about this you know i i ha i should have kept a list of all the things that people said that were in the wrong category and everyone has heard them i'm sure but i think really we are just generally a grief illiterate society right we we don't know how to you know prepare for grief or prepare for death quite honestly and if you you know, work for a company, you may get a couple of bereavement days, and then you're just expected to sort of go back to work and, and move along. Um, and I think just acknowledging and, and sharing that, that you are with that person, you know, it can be, um, you know, that you don't understand, you wouldn't possibly be able to understand this loss, but there, you're there to, for support, you're there to listen. Um, I think the most helpful thing people can do is just simply show up and show up and really take the temperature. I think for me, some of the nicest things people did in the year after Tracy died was um, my neighbors got together and took care of taking care of all of my leaves for me for the, for the whole season, they just did it. Or you can drop off a meal to somebody if, you, if they don't want a visit and just say, you know what, you keep this dish and I don't need a thank you note. So it's it's showing up and, or maybe saying, hey, can I come pick you up and take you out for a cup of coffee on Tuesday? Very simple gestures of ways that you can be helpful that require a yes or no answer um, so that you're not making the decision be put on the griever. So one thing I think you shouldn't say that we, we all are guilty of saying is, let me know if you need anything because you're in such a fog. There's no way I could possibly have thought of what I actually needed, but what I needed was my leaves removed, you know, the hot meal and the invitation to go out. Um, even if I declined the invitation, I still wanted the invitation. So those are sort of some, some suggestions that I have for people. Yeah. It's really just showing up and showing up to sit with somebody even if you just simply say, I don't know what to say, but I'm here. Um, you know, it's it's okay to, to be okay in the discomfort. So it, that's the best advice I can give to somebody is like, be comfortable with the uncomfortable. Esther, you had some suggestions as well. Yeah, I think um, we tend to fall <clears throat> excuse me, into these um, kind of standard phrases. And sometimes like Christy said, they they're meant with good intent but often not received with good intent um i had so many people say when mark was diagnosed and then after he passed there's a reason for everything and i just kept thinking there is really no good reason for this beautiful kind loving man to be suffering the way he is um, or to have suffered the way he is. And I, I didn't want to reply with that, but every time somebody said that, that's where my mind went, or he's in a better place. And I want to say, no, a better place is here with us. But, you know, I, I appreciate the, the thought of saying something nice. So some of the things that I personally found comforting, and uh, of course, this varies by person, everybody is different. But some of the things that helped me were when people would just say, I just can't imagine what you're going through, but I am here for you. Or simply just say, I don't know what to say. Um, if they just say, I love you. Yeah. You know, sometimes the more simple, the better. And one of the things I loved was when people would ask me, is it okay if I share a story with you about Mark? You know, the thing that they re will remember the most about him. Um, and it's a way to acknowledge the good in a person. Um, and it could be something like, I'm so happy you two found each other. He was a kind, generous person. Um, we will always remember Mark and using his name, you know, his memories will last forever. So it's okay to say Mark. Um, we had a friend who, is sort of the ultimate performer. He sings in bands and he does plays and whatnot. Um, and he's just a, the most natural person on stage that I've ever met. And um, so he shared the story with me that at one point he almost stopped going on stage because he had terrible anxiety, even though what the audience <laughs> saw was beautiful, but backstage he, he just almost couldn't do it. And Mark also suffered from some anxiety. And so he had talked our friend through a couple of times when, you know, he just didn't feel like he could go, he could go on. And my friend shared this story with me 
um, after Mark died. And I thought, you know, that's so Mark, that's so Mark. And that was just a beautiful moment to hear these kinds of stories about yeah. someone that, you know, I love so dearly. It's so true, Esther. So true. I actually bumped into somebody today at a, a networking event and I hadn't seen him in a long, long time. And he told me that he thinks of Tracy every single August. Like, you know, it's been five years. Like, do you know how beautiful that was to have somebody share that? So, you know, I think we're, we're so hesitant that we don't want to bring up the person's name and risk upsetting somebody. But, you know, you, you know, when your person dies, whether it's a parent or, uh, you know, your, your partner. So I think, you know, bringing somebody up and acknowledging what value and meaning and beauty that person had, you know, and maybe how that person impacted your life. I, it, it can't be, it, it's not upsetting. It's just very touching. And I think Christy, you know, you and I have that reaction, perhaps not everybody does, or it may be too raw. So asking somebody, mm -hmm. is it okay if I share a story with you and let them dictate, or it may be something that you'd like to share in a letter, something that can be written and held on to. Um, you know, the first year that Mark and I were married, we were in Mexico on a mission trip and we were there for Dia de los Muertos which is um, the day of the dead. And it was shocking to me, and this was before he was diagnosed, but it was such a different culture than what I'm used to because it was all about celebration. And, and this holiday, um, it's a joyful celebration rather than mourning. Um, over several days, family and friends gather, they pay respect and they remember friends and family members who have died. The celebrations can take a humorous tone. People remember funny events and share funny stories. I was amazed walking through cemeteries where there were parties set up every couple of gravestones. There would be a table with food and the family and it was just really, really festive. And it was such a different take on celebrating the dead than I think what we're used to what many of us are used to here. So that was a very powerful experience. I think when we also talked about this, we said, you know, incorporate your loved one if you want to into your, your new tradition or do something. I do remember that. So my mom died around this time of year and so the holidays are not so great. So I uh, dive pretty heavy into my therapy around this time of year, which is good. You know, that's important to me. And that's, you know, it's good to be able to talk about stuff. Well, for me, it works for, it doesn't work for everyone, you know, um, and, you know, talk about my mom and, um, you know, talk about the fact that she, you know, loved Christmas and I have a lot of her decorations that I put up. And, you know, um, I think that if you can, or if you want to honor or incorporate them, you know, into what you're doing, you know, I think that's a really important thing. And also just for all of you, you know, we're kind of talking generically, but for all of you who are dealing with dementia, either dealing with this, these losses because the person is not the same, or if you've lost your person, just know um, that we have a helpline, you guys, that is 24 seven. We have this amazing, amazing set of people who work through the holidays all day and all night, ready to be on that phone for you. So if you have any sort of just venting, just want to talk, they're there. And I'm going to put that, if you guys don't know by now, I feel like we say it every single time, but I'm going to put it in the chat. Um, but definitely that. And what other things can you guys suggest for, for folks, you know, if they need like an immediate, like an, an immediate need? I've seen a lot of uh, religious organizations that now have these blue services. And I, I think it's really fantastic to acknowledge that on a spiritual level, on a religious level, it's not a happy go lucky celebratory time for everybody. And so these services acknowledge that it can be really difficult for people during the holidays after suffering a loss or who are suffering a loss as they speak. Um, so it, it can give people that sense of belonging with the, their faith community, but also in a way that feels safe with other people who may be experiencing um, the same things that they are. So I, I'm really happy to see that these are being incorporated in lots of communities. 
And I think um, this came up last week at the a presentation I did. If, if you have lost your person and you need resources or support, there are a lot of organizations that provide, provide bereavement support groups, which I think are really um, a very helpful way to connect with other people who have experienced some type of loss. Um, you know, in the virtual world, they can be more accessible to you in terms of transportation. And I, I do urge people to, to take advantage of those if that's something that you feel you need. I know that I benefited tremendously from the group um, that I went to for a long time. It was just very helpful. Right, we have our support groups, you know, some of them are starting to go back in person, not too many, mm -hmm. uh, but our support groups are, you know, thriving, you know, they're, they're, there are plenty of them and there we have support groups at the Alzheimer's Association, you guys, for people with the disease, for couples, um, like one side, you know, one person has it, one is the caregiver, we have caregiver support groups, we have adult children support groups, spousal support groups, so there's a lot of choices, so um, I put it in before, but I can put it in again, it's alz.org slash crf, which is our community resource finder, or just call that 800 number to find a support group that is, that is near you, and I think that, you know, Esther, we have a lot of folks who are, you know, a lot of our support groups are run by our volunteers who've been trained. So a lot of it's that everyone kind of gets it, right? Who's in there. Yeah, many of our volunteers, whether they be community educators or support group leaders um, have been down this path. They've been on this journey. Um, I only started working here five years ago. And the only reason I ever connected with the association was because of Mark. And I happened to meet um, Carolyn, our Vice President of Programs and Education, at a health fair at a company that I was there for with my old organization, my old business that had nothing to do with Alzheimer's. And it was shortly after Mark was diagnosed and I saw Carolyn at her table. I was at my table and all day I kept saying, I really should go talk to her, but I don't know. I, you know, it was just so raw. And um, eventually I went over and um, she handed me her card and she said, when you're ready, I want you to call me. And it took me about two years. Um, nice. But since then we became involved with a support group, with a social engagement group. I was asked to speak at fundraisers. I went to the legislature with Christy and right. spoke, um, you know, and one thing led to another. And so when this job opened up, I knew, I just knew it was something I had to do. I just had to be able to support other people in their journey. And uh, so I tell people, for me, this is the best therapy that there could ever be. It's very healing, very cathartic. Yeah, it is. Christy, I know that you have a lot of brief resources that you like to share with other folks. I'm not going to be able to at this second put it in the mm -hmm. chat, you guys, but I will put it in afterwards because we're operating on the Zoom platform. So it's a little mm -hmm. challenging. So if you wanna share some of them and we'll put them in afterwards. Yeah, um, one good person and, and we will put them in afterward, um, David Kessler, who some of you may have heard of, he um, writes a lot of materials and does a lot of video recordings and he has a wonderful video for the holidays that's really addressing grief um, and ways to incorporate tradition and, and acknowledging your own process. So again, we'll link that in, in the chat after this, after our live uh, session ends. Um, and there's a number of other resources that we can link to as well. And, you know, um, I think it's, it is wonderful to know that, you know, the staff on our helpline can be helpful to you if you are, you know, going through losses or going through some changes with your loved ones, you know, we want to be here to support you um, and, and guide you throughout this process. Christy, I have to say, I was very intrigued by David Kessler. I had not um, seen the video, so I put it on for a few minutes this morning and there were two things that really struck me in the little bit I was able to watch. And one thing he said was, it's okay to let go of the pressure to make the holidays work. And I thought that that was really pretty insightful that it's okay to relieve yourself of that pressure. You don't have to make them work. And um, you know, another thing that crossed my mind as he was talking was, that it's okay to reassess your shoulds, you know, and decide perhaps life is different now. And it's okay to take a look at what you've always done. And if that still works for you, 
um, you know, and there's a lot of pressure from society, from families, from social media. Like we started off saying, you know, the perfect holiday. It's what we're all, we all should have this perfect holiday. Well, I don't like the word should. Yeah. So, you know, it's okay to reassess. Right. And do what works for you, right? Exactly. And even as Christy was saying, you know, just as we say, for those of you who have someone in your family who has, has dementia or someone loved one, tell the people ahead of time, FYI, this is what you might experience with her. She might not be you know, focused. She might be angry. She might be sad. She might go in the other room, whatever may, may happen. It's the same, right? When you, um, thank you for inviting me to this party. I may not show at the last minute. Forgive me. That's it. Right? It just might not be a good moment for me. So. Exactly. Exactly. And give yourself permission to let yourself off the hook because ultimately we all have to take care of ourselves. So it's, you know, even if people are kind in their words and their intentions are good and they're sharing their opinion of what they think you should do for the holiday, you can thank them for their opinions and then take care of yourself. And just to emphasize again, no explanation is needed. Right. It, it's okay to just state what you're going to do and be okay with that, um, you know, one of the things I used to say, people would ask me how I was doing in the midst of everything. And in the, in the midst of all this happening with Mark, I lost my mom to breast cancer. So it was a lot of whammies coming from everywhere. And, you know, people would ask me how I was doing. And on the one hand, I could have given them the pleasant answer, which is, oh, I'm okay, you know, I'm doing all right. The truth really wasn't quite so pretty. Um, but I came up with this kind of mantra that I would share, which was that I am doing the best I can with what I have in me right here, right now in this moment. And that's the best I can do and that's okay. And then people really didn't know what to think, but. <laughs> You know, it was just kind of my, my thing and just saying, you know, I'm doing what I can, yeah. I'm doing the best I can. And, and it's okay, what, wherever I am right at this moment, it's okay. Perfect. I think that's a great way to end it. It's okay, you guys, whatever you feel you can do and just know that we're here for you to reach out, know that we have the 800 number, um, know that uh, everyone who's involved, you know, we'll just take this opportunity to thank everybody who's involved and and volunteers with us and raises money for us and speaks for us and pushes policy forward for us and uh, who's helping us with our diversity, equity, and inclusion, who, you know, teaches classes, support groups, I mean, everything. We just are so grateful. We've had such a, it's been a really challenging year, but the fact that we're all still in this together and work really hard, we as the association are really, really grateful to everyone for all that you guys do. And, and thanks for being part of our family because it is a family. We're very, we're very close. And um, it's part because we have such a passion mm -hmm. to end this disease and to help as many families as we can along the way. So thank you for being our ambassadors and thank you for spreading the word and thank you for all you do. And uh, we're here for you guys. And we are going to, as we close this up, I'm gonna put on some of those links. Also Esther has a great um, share, creating best things in life yes. uh, document that I'll put on there as well. But uh, have a great uh, holiday, you guys. Best wishes for you guys towards the end of the year and a wonderful 2022 as well. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you so Bye, much. Bye, everyone. Thank you.